Well, good evening, uh, everyone, and thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much for coming. It would have been very boring without you. Uh, many people, since the book was published, have wondered, why will I write about Music Hall? Well, over 50 years ago, I sat at the bedside of an old man who was dying, and I held his hand. Some of the time, he was unconscious. And when awake, he was a bit jumbled. But I knew where his mind was, where he wanted to be. He'd gone back half a century. He was back on the stage in music hall. He was taking a bow. It was his final encore. That old man was my father, Tom. My father wasn't a great star, but he did appear alongside many of the greats. He began in music hall around about 1900. And for the next 30 years, he sang and joked and acted and later directed and managed his own review show, all with his first wife, Kitty. And their partnership ended when a safety curtain fell during rehearsal and crippled her. And before she died, Kitty asked a young dancer in the show to look after Tom, and she did for the rest of her life. As Tom's life drew to a close, she sat opposite me holding his other hand. She was my mother, Gwen. My book isn't their story, but their story is one part of it. The overall tale is a much grander tale than that of any two individuals. It's the story of the rise and the fall of Music Hall and the colorful people who were part of it. Music Hall didn't spring fully formed into Victorian life. It evolved from that uncrushable desire to entertain. When Cromwell closed the theatres a couple of hundred years earlier, the displaced musicians and singers moved to taverns, and singing rooms were set up that became an ancestor to music hall. When Wellington, as Prime Minister, was worried about the public consumption of gin, drunk for a penny, dead drunk for tuppence, was the way Hogarth put it. So the Duke promoted beer as a less alcoholic alternative. Bad mistake. The number of pubs multiplied, so did the number of singing rooms, and Music Hall came closer. It was Music Hall the child of many parents, of pleasure gardens, of health spas, of saloon theatres, and even penny gaffs, dreadful little places, where often brutal shows were shown in the front room or the back room of shops in some of the seedier parts of our great cities. Entrance fee, one penny. All of them played a role in the birth of Music Hall. And so did song and supper clubs, where a man called W.G. Ross entered show business history with a song called Sam Hall, a dark song a dark song in the character of a condemned man on the eve of his execution. Ross was a sensation. He sat on the stage and spat out the hate and fear of a man about to die a violent death, watched by a crowd of thousands who would then head home for supper. Sam Cowell sang of thwarted love, the rat catcher's daughter. Catchy song. The story of a working class couple about to marry when tragedy strikes. The girl drowns, the boy kills himself. Melodrama and pathos always touch the hearts of Victorian audiences. And Dickens, inevitably. Dickens in the guise of a mythical Mr. Joe Welks wrote of these audiences in London, in Hoxton at the Britannia Theatre, and he wasn't impressed. The clientele, he said, were dirty. They smelled. And many of the girls were grown into bold women before they'd ceased to be children. He also saw 3,000 slum dwellers crammed into the Royal Victoria, today you know it as the Old Vic, where his neighbor was so damp as to be quite mouldy. 
By the late 1840s, all the ingredients of Music Hall were present. They were brought together by a man called Charles Morton, and on the site of a pub once frequented by Shakespeare and by Burbage, he built what was probably, probably, the first purpose-built music hall, the Canterbury, in 1852. And notwithstanding its unsavory surroundings on Lambeth Marsh, the Canterbury was a huge success, attracting a family audience. From the 1860s onwards, a handful of genres began to define music hall. George Labour and his good-hearted rival Alfred the Great Vance created the swell persona, the foppish, upper-class buffoon, dressed in garish clothes, spats and monocles, and huge, dun-dreary sideburns. Think Bradley Wiggins multiplied by 20. Laybourne, Laybourne was one of the early greats of music hall. His contemporary, Jenny Hill, said he had a faculty for filling a stage. He had a faculty for filling his pockets too, but unfortunately for him, emptied them almost as speedily. But Champagne Charlie in the 1860s made him enduringly famous. Laban worked hard, played hard, and drank hard, often with friends who were gone when his money was gone. He died at 41, young like so many of them, bitter and disillusioned. And ironically, his very last song was set in a tea shop, but it wasn't the tea that killed him. It was the fame, false friends, heartbreak, and drink. Music Hall sometimes shaped public attitudes. In By Jingo, a song sung at the height of empire by G.H. McDermott, the lyrics advocated military intervention in the Crimea. We don't want to fight, but by Jingo if we do. We've got the ships, we've got the men, we've got the money too. We fought the bear before, and while we're Britain's true, the Russians shall not have Constantinople. Now, despite the dodgy last line, <laughs> you try and make it scan. The song fired public opinion, was raised in Parliament that didn't normally acknowledge Music Hall, and was a subject of a leading article in the Times which didn't either. Music Hall began to become a powerful force in public opinion. And another of his songs, W.E.G. is in a state of lunacy, left McDermott accused of being a pro-conservative stooge. W.E.G., of course, was William Ewart Gladstone, leader of the Liberal Party. Now, the Tory plot is unlikely. Mostly, take it from me, Tories only plot against each other. And anyway, many in the audience were pro-Tory because Disraeli had cut working hours while Gladstone had cut drinking hours. There was no doubt which was the most popular. Charlie Coburn warned audiences off political argument in his song, Two Lovely Black Eyes. Better, fi far better it is to let liberals and Tories alone, you bet unless you're willing and anxious to get two lovely black eyes. Now, Coburn had a point, of course. Although in politics, fisticuffs are rare, backstabbing is the weapon of choice. Now, Coburn was one of many whose whole career was based on one or two songs. His only other smash hit was The Man Who Broke the Bank at Monte Carlo with lyrics inspired by the exploits of a serial fraudster called Charles Wells. Coburn sang those songs for over 50 years before dying at the age of 93. And the year before he died, he attended a funeral with Tommy Trinder. And as they left the cemetery, Trinder said to him, how old are you, Charlie? And Coburn said, 92. Well, Charlie said, Trinder, are you sure it's worth going home? <laughs> Audiences 
Audiences loved the swell songs which mocked the idle upper class, but were equally partial to the Costa genre of Gus Elan, Albert Chevalier, and Alec Hurley. Costermongers were the Barra Boys of London, familiar to everyone. Elan was a typical Costa with his Cockney songs, including the very politically incorrect It's a Great Big Shame, in which he tells how he deal with a nagging wife, and the more poignant houses in between that struck a chord with all those who lived in cheap rooms, in nasty, unpleasant, insanitary, back-to-back -back slums. And that was most of the audience. Oh, it really is a very pretty garden, and Chingford to the eastward could be seen. With a ladder and some glasses, you could see to Ackley Marshes, if it wasn't for the houses in between. <laughs> the greatest early female star was the waif-like Jenny Hill. Jenny's childhood was tough and shrouded in legend. She allegedly was starving with a young child and was sent to a theater with a note and the proprietor, Emil Loibel, opened the note and said, you can perform tonight. We will see how you get on. And she appeared on stage, and she was a sensation. They kept calling her back. And eventually, for she hadn't eaten for days, she came off stage and she collapsed. And Loibel showed her the note which said, this woman is a menace and a pest. Don't offer her anything. Jenny Hill's songs were too topical to last. But the lyrics addressed social issues with all the force of a pile driver. She was a champion to the oppressed, a feminist trailblazer, and one of the greatest of music hall stars. And then there was Bessie Bellwood. Bessie, Bessie was cut from even coarser cloth than Jenny, an Irish girl, a rabbit skinner from Bermondsey. She had a sharp tongue, and she took no prisoners. Proudly working class, she had numerous uh, scandalous affairs with impecunious aristocrats whose bills she paid out of her extensive earnings. They were trophy men. Nothing is new. And in addition to numerous court cases over debts, Bess's solicitor was a busy man. On any one day, a charitable kindness in the morning might be followed by a public brawl in the afternoon. She allegedly bit a part of one antagonist's ear off and roughed up a cabbie who defended her. Bessie was not a woman to cross. And later, female acts were less pugnacious. Vesta Victoria specialized in victim songs. Waiting at the church tells of a bridegroom who doesn't turn up because his wife won't let him. And in Now I Have to Call Him Father, Vesta's mother ends up stealing and marrying Vesta's boyfriend. You see what I mean about victim songs. When she eventually gets uh, a boyfriend, her boyfriend takes her round to see his mother. And his mother looks her over and keeps saying, poor John, poor John. But Vesta Victoria toured America many times, became very rich, and enjoyed transatlantic success with a song you'll all know, Daddy Wouldn't Buy Me a Bow Wow, the lyrics of which seem innocent enough. Yet as my father told me, when performed by Vesta Victoria, they were anything but. Don't ask. Male impersonation began in the 1860s when Annie Hindle began to lampoon the swell persona. Annie's private life was rackety. She married twice, the second time to another woman. She and Anna Ryan lived happily together, both wearing women's clothes and ignoring social convention. And Annie was followed by imitators, Ella Vesna, Nellie Power, and Bessie Bonehill, a Birmingham girl who specialized in patriotic songs. And then there was Lona Barrison. Lona Barrison used cross-dressing only as a preliminary to undressing. Very risque. 
Germany expelled her as a, and I quote, notoriously obnoxious person. <laughs> Ella Shields had a whole string of memorable songs, and you'll remember them all if you knew Susie. Show me the way to go home. And in the Great War, she amused the troops hugely as she satirized the condition in the trenches with, oh, what a lovely war. But the two superstars of male impersonation were Vesta Tilly and Hetty King. Vesta Tilly, extraordinarily, began male impersonation at the age of eight. Her costumes were meticulous, and her songs became standards. The sentimental ballad, After the Ball, my father's favorite song, I can see him now sitting up in bed, singing it with a glass of whiskey in his hand. Those songs were accompanied by her dandy songs, Algae, Burlington Bertie, and many others. Her 1914 favorite, The Army of Today's All Right, was used by the War Office to encourage young men to enlist, which they did in large numbers. Hetty King's most famous song, another you'll know, All the Nice Girls Love a Sailor, was a flop when she sang it as a naval officer, but a sensation in the uniform of a rating. They just don't like officers, said Hetty of the audience. And she was still entertaining in her late 80s, the last of a very select group. In, in all of Music Hall's history, a handful of stars stand out. Mari Lloyd is perhaps the best remembered of them all. And her death in 1922 seemed to foreshadow the end of Music Hall itself. Tens of thousands lined her funeral route. There is no one alive who saw her perform. But my father talked of her often, and always with a smile and a story. The young Mari had a strong voice and a bubbly personality. Think a young Barbara Windsor. She was a perfect representative of the mean streets in which Music Hall thrived. For 37 years, Several shows a night, she held her place at the top of one of the toughest professions in the world. She had an empathy with her audience, and she remained forever one of them. To the end, she preferred eels and winkles and kippers to the grand fare of West End restaurants. Her act was saucy and her lyrics were full of innuendo. Was she vulgar? Yes, of course she was but only in a carry-on sort of way. Even though she was one of the most popular stars in the firmament, Mari Lloyd was snubbed and omitted from the first ever Royal Variety performance. Her last great song, My Old Man Said Follow the Van, did what she had always done. It tapped into the lives of her public. Mari Lloyd was queen of the halls and embodied the soul of the nation as few have ever done. The cruel diary of Virginia Woolf noted that in later life Mari was scarcely able to walk, waddling, aged, unblushing. She became a relic of the young Mari and collapsed on stage singing, ironically, I'm one of the ruins that Cromwell knocked about a bit. On her gravestone, the following words are carved. Tired she was, although she didn't show it. Suffering she was, and hoped we didn't know it. But he, above, and understanding all, prescribed long rest and gave the final call. The tragic Dan Leno, billed as the funniest man in the world in the United States, and the hyper-intelligent and sensitive Little Titch, both had dreadful starts in life. Dan Leno was the son of unsuccessful itinerant players 
who earned no more than a few shillings a week. At the age of four, his father died, his mother remarried, and his stepfather drank the meagre family earnings. Little Titch, born Harry Ralph, was the 15th child of a 77-year-old father. He was born with deformed hands and only grew to four foot six inches tall. But when he died in 1928, J.B. Priestley confessed that his death affected him more than the contemporary loss of Thomas Hardy, Field Marshal Haig, and Prime Minister Herbert Asquith. In the history of Music Hall, Little Titch can stand tall. Both became Music Hall legends. I earn more than the Prime Minister, said Dan Leno, but I do so much less harm. <laughs> but money didn't bring either of them contentment or happiness. When Dan Leno died, mentally unstable, Charlie Chaplin mourned the greatest comedian since Grimaldi. As Music Hall declined, some of its great stars prospered. George Roby. Roby began as an audience stooge for an American mesmerist, but soon developed his own comic creations. Disheveled clergymen, henpecked husbands, cantankerous landladies, nosy neighbors, pompous mayors, even Richard the Lionheart. Roby was an original. Song and patter merge effortlessly as he drew the audience into his fantasy world. When he turned to review, seduced by a salary of 500 pound a week before the First World War, he left us the charming legacy of Clifford Gray's If You Were the Only Girl in the World. Other reviews beckoned. So did stage and cinema, even Shakespeare, where Roby played Falstaff on stage and later on film in Laurence Olivier's famous Henry V. Another music hall giant, Harry Lauder, defined Scottishness. Lauder's songs, simple stories of lasses, love, and money, made him a megastar. He was lucky in love, with only one sweetheart whom he married, and to whom he remained devoted throughout his life. When he was offered the vast sum of $2,500 a week to appear in the United States, he sent a telegram to his wife. Will you come with me? She replied, see Book of Ruth, chapter one, verse 16. You will all be familiar with it, of course. <laughs> Whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. When he died at 79, the Times wrote, as long as the world loves singing, so long will Harry Lauder live. This evening, as ever, time is the enemy. So let me end this brief introduction to this evening with the same question with which I began. Why did I write this book? When my father was dying, he was visited by a string of shabbily dressed elderly folk whom prosperity, if it ever knew them, had long since deserted. I saw these old performers come alive. Their life was music hall, whatever its hardships had been. And they still burned to perform and they did at my father's bedside, and I sat there watching and listening to them and drinking it all in. So the question is wrong. It's not, why did I write this book? It is, how could I not? This book is for Tom and Gwen, the final encore for parents who had little to give but gave all that they had. If their ghosts are here tonight, and they very 
Well, maybe. I hope in the pages of My Old Man, I've faithfully painted those who entertained us so royally and whose talent deserves to be remembered for many years to come. have about 20 minutes chat now and I, I, I've, got, um, I've got about two hours material so we're, we're going to get going. We've got um, a little longer than that. <laughs> yeah, um, Sir so John, there's a, there's, a, there's a mischievous joke about you which I'm sure you're tired of hearing but um, it's said that you're the only man who's ever run away from the circus to join an accountancy <coughs> firm and um, I just, when, 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 when one thinks of your journey um, from a two two-room two flat in Brixton to um, Companion of Honour and Knight of the Garter and, and a cricket expert and at the very heart of the establishment. It's, it's for some reason um, more extraordinary because you came from showbiz. And I, I don't know whether that's because showbiz is regarded as, as, as frivolous or, 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 or it's because of your spitting image as, as the grey man, which is in stark contrast to, I suppose, the, the, the bright lights of music hall. Was, um, was there any way that your life is a, can be seen or started out, or was ever a reaction against those, that background, or, or was that the way, I know the press certainly interpreted that, didn't they, and, and mocked you for well, it? Well, I'll tell you a story about that. Um, uh, actually, it's incorrect at the start. I ran away to join a bank. <laughs> Though I suppose it's not socially acceptable to mention that day, so strike that from the record. <laughs> I'll stick with being an accountant. No, um, I would have... Uh, if my life had really gone as I wished it to have gone, I would have ended up as a professional cricketer. I would have been perfectly happy to go on stage. Um, I love the theatre. I love the life of the theatre. If ever I can get, particularly to see the live theatre, I will uh, be there. Um, but there was one thing I lacked in terms of getting into the theatre. Talent. <laughs> and that is a bit of a drawback. Um, so I decided that wasn't quite right. Um, the, I'll tell you how the grey man thing emerged. Um, when I was chief secretary, um, my hair began to go grey. And I was sitting in the House of Commons in the tea room one day when a friend yelled across the room, he's going grey, it's the grey man. And it stuck quite pleasantly for a while and then later circulated and began to appear in a quite different fashion. But that's actually how it arose. But uh, did I go into the city and politics as a reaction against show business? No, emphatically not. If I thought I could have been successful in it, I would have been very attracted to doing it. Uh, but I didn't, and I wasn't, so I didn't. <laughs> was there, was there, um, there must have been something, uh, attributes of, of, of your showbiz parents which helped in politics, which, uh, I mean, what, for instance, your um, soapbox campaigning, and I think you preferred that to television or well, to... Well, sure. I mean, you're facing real people with a soapbox. You can actually look at them and they can respond, and there's a bounce back. I mean, you must see that every night. And you, you're just in front of a television. I mean, television and I never did one another any favours. Uh, I didn't much <laughs> like television, and I don't think television uh, much liked me. The fisheye of the camera was always too remote. There's no flesh and blood about it. Um, standing on a soapbox, there is flesh and blood. Standing in the House of Commons, there's flesh and well, more blood than flesh, actually. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, certainly there. And, and I prefer that, uh, that human reaction that contact to the artificiality of uh, a television. I'm more at ease with television now. I've been doing it for a long time. But I certainly wasn't many years ago. And was there an element to the... Uh, I don't know if you developed a thick skin. I suppose you have to in politics. But, but certainly you talk about your, your mother as being someone who was philosophical about life and, and misfortune was greeted in mm -hmm. much the same way as good fortune. And was there... A, was that good training ground for your politics? It must have been. <laughs> it was essential. Um, my mother expected misfortune to come knocking at her door because it did regularly. 
And when it did, she was prepared for it. And she, I mean, my mother had been in show business, um, working for my father as a young dancer. And as far as she was concerned, her philosophy was quite simple. A show opened, a show closed. You were top of the bill, you were bottom of the bill. You had money, you didn't have money. But tomorrow was another day. And tomorrow, anything might happen. And it was with that uh, optimistic viewpoint that she saw the family through the, uh, the many lows of the 1950s and the early 1960s. Um, the family revolved around my father in many ways, because he was a Victorian man and much older. I mean, my father was 65 when I was born. My mother was surprised. <laughs> but it was my mother who, when the chips were down, would become the central focus in the family. Did it hurt when you were mocked? I mean, was, was, wasn't there a period in the press when, when you were mocked for your background and for... Well, I felt sorry for the people who felt that way. I mean, my mother brought me up to believe that everyone should be treated equally. And it didn't matter where you came from, what you had. You had the same inner spirit and you were entitled to the same courtesy. And I felt the people who couldn't see that, I rather felt sorry. I thought they must have had a deprived background not to understand that that was the case. So, do these things hurt? Well, it is commonly believed that politicians have a great thick carapace of a skin and nothing gets through. Well, can I let you into a secret? As this is a private meeting and nothing will leak. <laughs> um, that's not true. But politicians have to pretend nothing matters. In all my political life, I've only met two politicians who genuinely didn't care what was written about them. And since one is still about active in politics, I'm not going to tell you who they are. Of but course. I've only ever met those two. Mostly, it's not true. Who was the other one? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no, you can't ease me down that route. <laughs> and, uh, well, I suppose, do you think that's a lack of imagination or, a, or just a, a, a brute thick skin, I suppose? Well, it's either a supreme self-confidence, it could be that, or it could be a lack of imagination. It's one or the other, or both. But as to which, I'm not sure I could tell you. Um, what, what, I, I really, really love the book. It was, it's, um, it's, it's very evocative. You, 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 do, you achieve, um, I suppose, the most difficult thing is that we can't quite imagine what it was like uh, to go to the music hall, or even there isn't much record. Although, actually, a surprising number of the performers are on YouTube. Little Titch is on YouTube, and I, I, Murray Lloyd's, you can hear on um, um, just the audio. And so what the book is great for is evoking how they were on stage. And um, I'm wondering, the thing that really struck me was, first of all, the artists, as you've, just, you've discussed quite a few of them, but also the halls. And it really struck me, I thought, my, what a great night out it, mm. it must have been. Can you... Can you sort of uh, give us an idea of, for instance, Morton's, the first music hall. Um, can you give us an idea of what, hmm. what it was like to go there? Well, it changed through the years. If we can go back before Morton's to the 1830s, early 1840s, most of the theatres were very rough. The stage might be no more than a platform, no lights, of course, no footlights, no microphone, uh, a large audience, a very a rough and low-income audience, very, if you dare work, use the word, working-class audience in those days, and they would sit up there eating, just as they'd done in Shakespeare's days. And the women would sit up there, particularly with babies on their hips, the young women, and the audience, many of them were very young, uh, with babies on their hips, eating cold fried soles and throwing the fish bones around. So it wasn't a very salubrious place in the 30s and the early 40s. <coughs> And then Morton developed the Canterbury, which was infinitely better than anyone had seen before. It was plush. It had far more seats. It had carpeting. And people began to respond to the better environment and behave, uh, behave a good deal better. And then it didn't become big enough. And he actually did something quite extraordinary. He rebuilt it 
while they were still using it by building over the top and enlarging it, then removed the old roof, had the new roof, and a much bigger auditorium. And it was opened over a weekend. They didn't close at all. And then gradually, the nature of the theatres began to change. The stage became a good deal better than it had previously been. They began to replace the tables and chairs that people sat at with rows of seating like this. This didn't start till about the 1860s, rows of seating of this sort. Before that, there was tables. Tables, in chairs, and people would eat and drink, and you'd be performing over that noise. And at the back of the chairs, they'd have a little platform to put your drink on. And later, when the can-can came to London, um, uh, Charles Morton put uh, binoculars on the back of the seats, which you could get out by putting sixpence in the slot. Uh, as the can-can became ever more popular, though not with the authorities or the media. Uh, the media had lots of articles of, al along the line of the menace of can-canism must be stamped out. <laughs> <laughs> but the theatres gradually became more grand because of a man called Frank Matram. Matram right. designed most of the great theatres. If, to if today you go to um, the Colosseum or the Palladium or the Grand in Blackpool or the Royal Victoria, they were designed by Frank Matram. Mm. He was the one who removed the stands, the, 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 the pillars that used to block the views and put steel girders under the first floor. He was the one who gradually began, began to make them curve. He introduced fire locks and all sorts of safety improvements. And between the 1860s and the 18, late 1880s is probably the only time in history when it was actually a profitable venture to build new theatres. And they changed dramatically in that time. But, and, and they got, I mean, amazingly sophisticated. The, uh, the, there's, a, there's, one, the, there's an extraordinary, the, the statistics in your book are really interesting. The, is it Astley's um, Equestrian had 200,000 gas jets, gas lights. Yes. I mean, they were vast, these places. They were very big. And, and how many people were going every hold, night? Oh, they would hold many thousands. Some of them would hold up to 5,000 people. They were absolutely huge. When the Palladium was first built, it was uh, so big that one of the performers described appearing there as like spitting into a canyon, it, the sheer size of it. But of course, the gas lights mention another point. Many of these were wood. They burned down quite regularly. Mm. The Oxford Theatre burned down three times. At the Exeter Theatre in the 18, I think 1871, I could be wrong about the date, the Exeter Theatre burnt down and uh, 186 people were killed. Right. And health and safety began then to intervene, demand more safety and measures, and the number of theatres began to diminish because when you put in the safety measures, it was no longer profitable to build them. And is that why, I mean, you talk about the old Vic uh, holding three and a half thousand people, and I performed there, and we only had, we had, we had a thousand maximum, mm -hmm. so uh, that was, was it because, I mean, would they have been packing people in and they'd hanging off the rafters? People. and They'd have packed people in. I mean, they'd have had groundlings, some of whom would have stood. The seats wouldn't be remotely as comfortable as those everyone is sitting in this evening. They'd have been much ruder and cruder than that in the early days of uh, the Royal Britannia, as it was then called. And correspondingly, they packed many more people in at a very cheap price, probably, for most of them, only threepence. Right. Um, you devote a lot of one chapter to, to the really interesting, uh, the, the Mary Whitehouse of her day, um, mm. whose name I've forgotten now. But Laura Ormiston Chant. Ormiston Chant. And she yes. was trying to close down the uh, Empire Leicester Square. Is that the same building as theirs today? Yep. Uh, yeah. The, uh, this was in 1894. Uh, Laura Ormiston Chant had been a nurse. She had worked in the East End. She'd seen all the deprivation of many of the girls in the East End and the diseases that followed. And she was determined to try and cut back on that. And... Um, I mean, there's a, yes, there's a, another figure you have is... There were 3,000 brothels in London, 80,000 prostitutes. Yes. I mean, that's just staggering, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, she had a point. Don't do, she had a very good point. Don't, don't do the arithmetic. Well, I mean, if you go to Wilton's, still... Uh, How many were in London? What was the population in London, then? Sort of oh, the population in London, a couple of million, I would think, no more. 
Right. If, if you go to Wilton's, which is still extant and is just being renovated with lottery money um, <laughs> to uh, appear as a music hall, room, Wilton's was built across the back garden of, uh, of five houses and you had to pass through a brothel in order to get into Wilton's. So the shows often started a little late. <laughs> but what a night out. What a night out, as you know. But Churchill is involved in that story of the empire. Yes. Yeah. Because Laura Ormiston Chant realised around the empire there was a promenade. And lots of uh, prostitutes would assemble there, but they weren't the girls in some of the worst streets. These were really rather high-class, well-dressed, well-bred, reasonably well-educated girls, many of whom in due course married their clients. And it wasn't apparent immediately what was going on. But Laura Ormiston Chant had been there several times. She was chairman of the National Vigilance League. And she realized what was going on, and she opposed the renewal of the empire's license um, on the grounds that the people who ran the empire were benefiting from prostitution. Right. Because people were going there because of the girls rather than because of the show. <laughs> and there was a huge row. The press uniformly took the side of the empire right. and against Laura Ormiston Chant. And uh, the newly born LCC had to decide, and they were split absolutely uh, down the middle between the Puritan and non-Puritan elements of the LCC and the Embryonic Labour Party. And for a while, they tried to ban it. They put up screens to prevent the girls going in. And this is where Churchill enters the story, because as a young subaltern, he was one of the young men who tore down the screens and trampled on them, and then made a speech to the assembled people about uh, the free market and free enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting on that, uh, on that very sub that the Telegraph you quote as uh, telling its readers that closing the empire, th they hit the empire because it was the biggest one, was it? It was the most fashionable. It was yeah. the most fashionable. But actually, I mean, it's pr pretty unfair because at the empire also were the rent boys who brought Oscar Wilde down. Right. And nobody mentioned that. That was sort of absolutely not mentioned at all. It's like Queen Victoria not... Well, believing in lesbianism because... Well, well it, uh, yes, well... <laughs> but <laughs> it wasn't illegal because nobody dared tell Queen Victoria what it was all about. Right. <laughs> so they hadn't legislated. But I, I was struck by this one phrase that the Telegraph said that closing the empire would mean the West End would once more become a howling wilderness of brazen-faced men and women, which is, of course, what it is today. <laughs> I'm, 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 How I'm very re prescient of the Telegraph. <laughs> Well, I was, I was really struck. I thought, you know, the Colosseum and the Hippodrome and, and the Lyceum and, you know, and uh, w what a miserable night out we can have there now. I mean, it's not bad. But then I, I, I really felt we'd, we've lost a lot. Well, I think we have lost a lot in many ways. I mean, in the early days... So why days don't we the reopen theater? it? You and me. <laughs> <laughs> you appear, I'll help. <laughs> you sort out the licensing. <laughs> well, we could do what Charles Morton used to do with the old theatres. He would walk up and down the aisles with an oven full of hot baked potatoes, which he would serve with lashings of butter. Yeah. Now, who would like a hot baked potato <laughs> with lashings of butter? Let's have a quick show of hands for a hot baked potato. I think we'd probably sell quite a few. <laughs> Can we, um, we better, uh, what I, I'd love to talk about um, some more of the artists, because they... Uh, yes, of course. Um, they're just such amazing stories. And, and the one, um, let's talk about George Roby, um, who was, who is also, you can see him on YouTube. When he died, he was one of the few who lived into his 70s or 80s. He did. So he was still around, I think, in the 20s yep. and 30s. Yeah. And um, well, can you tell us a bit, bit more about him? I, I, I love the, uh, actually, you've got a wonderful description. Maybe I'll read it out. You, this, this is the great thing about this book, is that you do evoke what his performance would have looked like. And you don't get it on YouTube when he was, as you point out, they were not recording artists and they were um, at the end of their careers. And so you don't get an idea of, of, of what the attraction was. But you do a brilliant, there's a brilliant passage. Can I, can I read it? Jo yes, um, George Roby brought originality to his performance. While most performers simply walked to center stage, addressed the audience and began their act, Roby made his entrance on stage as if pushed or chased there by characters unseen. He was the first guy to do that. Having gained the audience's attention in this way, he would pause, assessing the atmosphere, his demeanor invariably attracting a laugh. 
He would then shout, desist, desist, not unlike Frankie Howard in a later age, or really, I mean to say, immediately establishing rapport with the audience. To the accompaniment of sustained laughter, a po-faced Roby would then go on to say, let there be merriment by all means, but let that merriment be tempered with dignity. Remember, he was dressed absurdly. And the reserve, and the reserve which is uh, compatible with the obvious refinement of our environment. His aura of slight pomposity and self-ridicule made for a winning formula. It's brilliant. You get completely um, what that performance and, 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 and his, his descendants, oh, who were Frankie Howard and Bruce Forsyth. You well, mentioned. absolutely. Well, if you take Dan Leno, his Rowan Atkinson is a direct descendant of Dan Leno. So was the Guten Show. I mean, almost nothing is new. It's all been developed from what happened before. And you see with these early stars how it has been developed for a televisual age. But, but Roby was, was wonderful. I mean, he came from a fairly middle-class family. His parents wanted him to uh, uh, go into some form of engineering. Uh, he began performing as an amateur. He changed his name to Roby from his family name of Wade to avoid embarrassing his parents. And originally it was spelled R-O-B-Y. He changed it to E-Y when it was misprinted once on a playbill and he thought it was better. And um, he developed a huge range of characters. Um, I mentioned them earlier, so I won't reiterate them again. But he had huge success in almost every aspect of, uh, of show business. He also had lots of passions. He, he was a passionate a collector of antiques, particularly Chinese and Japanese uh, porcelain. <coughs> He was fanatically keen on sport, member of the MCC, played cricket with WG Grace, um, played for Millwall, Chelsea. Did he? In, uh, yes, in charity games. Right. No, he wasn't in their first 11, but he played for them, in, <laughs> uh, to the best of my knowledge. Though sometimes I've seen them play, he might well have been. Um, uh, and he played for them in charity games. He was fanatically keen on all sorts of sport. And he was also very active. When he moved from doing six shows a night in different theatres, driving between theatres, doing a half-hour act, probably only 20 minutes, moving on to the next one, and he went into review, he had long gaps in the interval and between acts, and he didn't know what to do with himself. So he decided, someone suggested he started to make violins, and he did. <laughs> and he made violins very successfully in the interval, in the midst of his shows. You, you quote he that. also had a fairly rackety private life. Oh, did he? Yes, he did. When he saw temptation, he usually considered it and then gave in. <laughs> There's a wonderful passage you quote from uh, Max Pemberton writing about Roby, um, because he did yes. a, lot, a lot of work yes. in World War I. The Boys in the Trenches, that one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it, it's, it's uh, you say his jests are repeated. Um, we at home will never understand what the name George Roby means to them out there on, at the front. His jests are repeated in the silence of no man's land. In darkness and despair, men will see visions of the great lighted house and the figures of pretty women and flowers from the gardens of England. Upon this scene comes a man who has but to look at them to banish their ills. Mm. It's, I, I, it's desperately moving. and I, I, mm. Anyway, I, I'd love to... He was, a very, he was a very great uh, performer. Um, what about... Uh, Oh, yes. Um, later on, we, you talk about Charles Blondin. He was, uh, there's a wonderful chapter in the book about um, music all overseas, and I suppose London was the centre of the world in terms of that sort of entertainment. Of um, why, why was London that? Uh, because of its political importance? or? Well, I would argue today, in terms of any form of thespian activity, that London is better than anywhere else in the world. New York might challenge that, but I go to New York a lot. And when I see something on the New York theatre that I've seen in London, I've never seen it done better than it is done in London. And I think that was probably true then. Lots of British stars went to America. There were very few Americans who came here. And I think that is an indication that this was the centre uh, and, the, and the best of entertainment. And there were some remarkable people uh, who, uh, who were there, and some of them were hugely eccentric. I mean, you had very eccentric magicians, you had, you had people whose lives were devoted to those moments on stage when they lived, perhaps better than any other time. 
And when their talent went, there was nothing left in their life. Mm. Uh, Mark Sheridan and T. E. Dunville, for example, both heard people disparaging their act as they got a little older and killed themselves because they couldn't bear it. Because I think people sometimes tend not to realize that when you get great skill like that, to inhabit another body, to entertain, to be someone else, there is a sensitivity in being able to do that that is greater than most of us have. And when that sensitivity is hurt, the reaction is greater than it is for most of us. And these very human people couldn't quite take that mm. and died. And there were many others who were very eccentric. There was a magician called Washington Bishop. Uh, Washington Bishop was a fraud. Uh, he was sued for libel. He was a bit of a villain. And he collapsed on stage and he died. And he had left a will leaving his body to science if it wanted it. Um, and science did want it, and it, uh, science uh, began to dismember it. The next day, Washington Bishop's mother turned up and said, but he wasn't dead. <laughs> He's always collapsed like this. It's just a fit he has. He wasn't really dead. The doctors have killed him. So there was all sorts of fuss. They did a second autopsy where, for some curious reason, they found his brain in his chest cavity. And there was a frightful fuss, a frightful fuss for ages, while people decided whether the doctors had really killed this chap before they realized that his mother was as big a fruitcake as he was. <laughs> <laughs> was he Datus, Datus? No, was... Datus was a man called John Bottle. <coughs> um, if any of you saw the first, uh, if you remember the 39 Steps, the original one, Mr. Memory on stage, Mr. Memory was based on Datus. Datus was a man called John Bottle. And John Bottle got on the stage by accident. He was talking in the bar of a pub about a very famous case, the Tichborne Claimant. Mm. The Tichborne Claimant was a man called Arthur Orton, who claimed the Tichborne baronetcy. And for a long time, people believed he really was the Tichborne Air. He wasn't. He was a complete and utter fraud. Did little Titch get his name? Exactly. Yeah. And eventually Arthur Orton went to jail for rather a long time. Well, there are two spin-offs from this. One, in a pub, uh, this boy, John Bottle, was reeling off all of the facts about Arthur Orton and Titchborn, and it became clear that he was a genius at remembering dates. So they called him Datus and put him on stage, and he was the model for Mr. Memory, in the 1939. Um, and um, the other point you raised was? Um, what? Little Titch. Little Titch. Yes, of course. Um, when Little Titch started, the Titchborn claimant, Arthur Orton, was 20 stone. He was huge. And when tiny Harry Ralph appeared on stage, people started calling him Little Titch. And so he began to style Because he was fat himself. as well as short. Or, or he was tubby as a little boy, right. yes. Yeah. He became thin later, but as a little boy, he was tubby. Yeah. And uh, they began calling him Little Titch, and it stuck as a stage name. Um, Blondair, can we talk about him? He, he, um, I mean, it was extraordinary what he did, the, the, the show across the uh, Niagara Falls. Mm. Um, and he had a great rivalry with, with the great Farini, who you don't seem to have much time for, or you think he's a <laughs> bit of a fraud. Well, he was a fraud. Um, or, or what he did was, I mean, Blondin did the most astonishing things, walking across Niagara Falls, offering to carry the Prince of Wales on his back, an offer that for some reason was declined. Um, and he used to appear in theatres with a rope stretched across the theatre, and people would pay five pound at Sheffield Theatre to be wheeled in a barrow above the audience by, um, by Blondin. He also wheeled a little lion cub, did the most extraordinary things. And most of his feats were repeated by the great Farini. But when the great Farini retired, he adopted a boy whose name was Sam Wastgate, who was a trapeze artist. And he appeared for a while as a trapeze artist doing OK. When Farini had a brilliant idea, he changed Sam Wastgate into Lulu, the beautiful girl acrobat. <laughs> And Sam Wasgate appeared as Lulu for several years, doing the most extraordinary things on the trapeze, which were thought to be even more extraordinary because they were being done by a girl.
Right. Now, how they carried off that deception backstage in the sort of conditions in which they changed backstage, I have never been able to understand. Was he Front of stage, I can see how they did it, but backstage, not at all. Was she the first person to be fired out of a cannon? Didn't Farini... No, that, no, that was Zazel. But right. that was also Farini. It was Farini who invented the spring mechanism that enabled someone to be fired out of a cannon. And um, uh, he, he appeared as manager of a theatre, did all sorts of extraordinary things. Um, the French... Uh, uh, it seems that the French and the English sensibilities were not always well matched. And, um, <laughs> I think I know where you're going. I, well, I know, well, I was going to mention Leotard because I like yes. the name. And, and Paul Leotard died... 28. He's 28. He was 28, yes. Um, but I, no, the one that uh, I had heard of before was, was of course, Joseph Pujol. Yes. Who was, a, who was um, the aptly named, who was, a, as you, you, you brilliantly managed to skirt. And he, um, he was a fartiste, wasn't he? Well, um, he managed to pass air through an external orifice. Yes, that's certainly true. And, and other things. And, yeah. and, 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 and he could fart the Marseillaise, I think. And, and, but he came, and he was a huge star in France, wasn't in he? In France, yes. And then he came over here and couldn't get a, and couldn't get couldn't a, get a booking anyway. I always thought that spoke rather well of the British. <laughs> there I've always been very happy for the French to claim him as one of their own. <laughs> it reminds me of so many meetings I had with them. <laughs> there was a similar act on, um, on X Factor on Britain's Got Talent, and that was, I thought he was hilarious, this guy, but they, he got a, a, um, you know, a cross from all the judges. <laughs> do you think that uh, X Factor and Britain's Got Talent, do you think they're the sort of, the, air, the, the present day heirs of musical variety? Well, I think in, in some ways, some of the acts are, certainly. And so are some of the uh, working men's clubs in the north, where you get stand-up comedians many of whom would have been very similar to those that would have been in the early stages of uh, music hall. There's a lot of music hall type uh, artists still around. Bruce Forsyth, complete music hall. Shirley Bassey, total music hall. Roy Hudd, music hall to the core. There are lots of people who today have that essential quality of reaching over the footlights to the audience and drawing them in, which was the classic gift of the great uh, music hall performers and the style of their acts is very similar so you could resurrect it if people would go and uh, if people would go and see it and sing the great chorus songs that they all would know because of course in those days the 1840s 50s 60s 70s 80s 90s no radio no television no other drama in only about six theaters in the country because it was banned elsewhere by law so the only entertainment was music hall. And people would go along and they would know the songs, they would know the choruses. Songs today that we have wholly forgotten, the audience would know and they would join in and sing. And if you were performing and singing Champagne Charlie, let us say, you would probably be required to sing that three or four times before you could leave the stage because nobody could buy a CD and take it home and play on their, mm. on their, uh, on their um, recorder at home. Couldn't do that. So their only entertainment was live and immediate. And they wished to hear those songs again and again and again. And that is, of course, how so many of the performers managed to get through a very long career with the sort of material that a modern a performer would use up in a couple of weeks. Right. So television, and uh, that's another way in which television and film... Well, three things killed music hall. The microphone, radio four things, cinema and, and later television. All of those, music hall existed in the soul of the nation. And when the nation moved on, music hall collapsed. Without the people, the artists reflected the lives of their audience. And their audience recognized them. They were the people who could have lived at the end of their street except that they had talent and, and were able to perform. It is a different social background to the one we have today. And of course, people like Chaplin 
Or Chapman. Well, it was a Londoner, a Lambeth boy. Yeah. And uh, um, many of uh, Chaplin's mannerisms were probably copied from Little Titch. Um, Chaplin never acknowledged that, but he always spoke very warmly of Little Titch being a genius. And Titch, of course, hugely intelligent, terribly malformed at only four foot six with these malformed hands and so forth, but a very good brain and hugely sensitive. And he was given all sorts of honors by the French who admired him. The greatest genius in the world, said one Frenchman, speaking of Titch. But he was never acknowledged by the authorities in Britain at all. And he resented that very much. It hurt him very deeply that he could be honored in a foreign country, but ignored in his own. Well, I think uh, we better, if anyone's got any questions, can we, uh, can we open it out to you? Any, yes, just, just here. We, we, we. Have you ever been to the Queen's I, I haven't, but I'm expecting, to go, I'm expecting to go before Christmas. The question was, have you ever been to the Players' Theatre? Yes. Can you just, will you take that microphone there? Great. Well, sorry. <laughs> I'll rephrase that. I've never seen a performance there. Oh. We have we, our, our like. next our next show at the New Players Theatre um, in Villiers, just off Villiers Street, um, is on the second of December. Right, we'll see you all there. <laughs> just behind, just behind there. Yeah. Oh, good evening, and thank you for a very entertaining talk on the musical. Um, I'm fascinated to ask a senior politician uh, what what lessons the musical might teach today's politicians. Communication, holding an audience, etc. Boris Johnson has clearly mastered the lot, and I wondered what you think it might teach our current cabinet and prime minister. <laughs> well, I have, uh, I have promised myself that during the trip and the meetings I have to discuss the book, I'm not going to talk about politics, not party politics. I think generally there's a great deal that Music Hall can teach people about the way people live. It's a very human activity, Music Hall. All the human instincts are involved, both with the artists and with the audiences. And from that, I think you can learn a lot. But I'm not sure how much I would actually apply that to modern politicians with, the, with a spotlight unlike anyone has ever faced before from the media. It must have been much easier to be a politician even 40 years ago when there wasn't 24-hour media and there wasn't so many outlets, it would have been much easier. You had thinking time. Nowadays, you can be anywhere in the world and suddenly bounced with something about which you haven't previously heard, about which you haven't been briefed, upon which you're expected to pronounce and have a clear-cut opinion that you should stick to or otherwise you're engaging in a U-turn. Now, that is a problem that Mr. Gladstone, Mr. Disraeli, Mr. Churchill, Mr. Lloyd George never had to face. So I think in many ways they had it a good deal easier uh, many years ago than they do. It's very, very difficult these days. And I think unless you've seen it at close quarters, people don't realize how difficult it can be. My name is Montague Thomas Norman. My grandfather was Tom Norman, the penny showman. And he was vilified f for showing the elephant man and various people of that nature. But do not realize or do not think that these, at those times, that the people that were being shown were being treated far better than they would have been had they not been in the shows. Also, I'd like to say that I was brought up in Brixton. My father was Hal Denver, who knew your father and mother. And I also ran away from the circus because my, and I was uh, brought up as a, in a foster home in Walliam, and my father would turn up to see me from a local circus where he was in a car with bullhorns on, dressed as a cowboy. And he, spe 
his name was Hal Denver, and he spent his life dressed as a cowboy with his knife throwing act that toured the world and was also on many of the shows that you mentioned. Thank you. Well, Brixton, of course. <laughs> I know that you wrote to me a little while ago because I have a photograph here of, your, of the two majors on a circus program that was, I was not able to find out what the date is, but I believe it was in the 1920s. Had it not, if it isn't your mother or father, yeah. and they were living in Brixton as well, are they related to you? No, they're not. Okay. No, they, <laughs> I, I mean, they turn up... Uh, of that name. There are people of that name who turn up in the 1880s, 90s, 1910s, 1920s. To the best of my knowledge, they're not relatives. And one reason I'm pretty certain they're not is that our family name isn't Major. Major was a stage name. It is the name by which I was christened. It is my name, uh, but it wasn't my father's name. Um, and so they weren't relatives. No, they certainly weren't. Brixton, of course, was a huge centre for uh, music hall and theatre generally, right the way through the second half of the 19th century and the early part of the uh, 20th century. So I'm, I'm surprised to hear what you say and very interested to, to hear it. As far as the first part of your question is concerned, people lived then in less sensitive ages. There was not only the, the so-called freak shows, which drew huge crowds, and people like Tom Thumb. And one wonders, Tom Thumb became world famous. Uh, brought over to England by uh, Barnum. But did he ever, I wonder, have a happy moment in his life? I'm not sure whether he would have done. And um, there was a lot of that sort of entertainment. And of course, in that less salubrious age, you also had the early um, minstrel shows, which would be entirely politically unacceptable today. Can you imagine an act on BBC, G.H. Eliot, The Chocolate Coloured Coon? I don't think so. I don't think people would, different attitudes these days, people would regard it these days as offensive. And the patter of, say, Eugene Stratton, one of the great music hall performers, um, the song Lily of Laguna. How many of you know that? Lily of Laguna? Well, one of the most beautiful songs, I think, of all time that he sang. But he had a patter between his songs that was outrageous. You couldn't possibly say that today without finding yourself in court in about two seconds. So they, they were very less, uh, they, they were very less careful about other people's sensitivities uh, than people are today. <coughs> uh, yes, right, uh, hand right at the back there. Sir John, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, you'd be wrong not to answer this question if you thought it related to politics, because it really relates to what you've talked about today about um, working class entertainments, the fact you're sharing a stage with an old attorney. That's a very bad microphone. Oh, actually. sorry. It, it's I, very muffled up here. Sorry, I'll, I'll be louder. It, you'd, be wrong, you'd be wrong not to answer this question if you thought it related to politics. It arises completely out of what you've been talking about, that is entertainments for the working class. You're sharing a, a stage with an old Etonian. And I just wondered whether you thought, would it still be possible for the son of a showman, for the daughter of a grocer to be head of today's Tory party? <coughs> or, or would you say that you are, in the words of, allegedly in the words of the chief whip, um, you or, or uh, Baroness Thatcher are too plebeian to rise to that height today? I think anybody who has the talent, the will and the good fortune could be leader of any of our major parties these days, and I think it's an extremely good thing that they can. And I personally wouldn't discriminate against old Etonians. <laughs> Some of them aren't half bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, down here. If we could ever persuade you to be a master of ceremonies at your own musical night, ah. who do you think are the modern acts that you would invite on as your sort of fantasy, modern music hall performers? Oh, crikey, I think I need notice of that. Um, Stav well, Stavros Flatley, do you ever see them? The Greek, the Greek dancers. <laughs> 
No, I really think I'd need notice of that. I mean, I'd certainly start with Bruce Forsyth and Roy Hudd. They would be absolutely nailed on certainties. I'd like Rowan Atkinson. That would be, uh, that would be a pretty good addition. I'm trying to think of modern singers who might, uh, who might be a, I think Adele, perhaps, we would certainly have done extremely well in music hall time. So you can take real talent and you would absorb it into music hall and it would work. Um, it would be different because times are different, but then the acts of the 1890s were different from the acts of the 1840s. It evolved, always it evolved. And the great tragedy of it, really, is that we can't, it's not properly captured on record. There are records, both visual and oral, of uh, people like Mari Lloyd. But when Mari Lloyd recorded songs in a tiny little box studio with no audience and not very good recording equipment, she had no audience from which she could bounce. And she recorded the song when she had been singing night after night, several theatres a night for over 30 years without a microphone. And so her voice, very harsh and rough compared to the reality of what people would have heard in their peak. So you can listen to those records today and most of them, frankly, aren't very good. You have to use your imagination to see what they are, what they really must have been like. And if you read, if you read the patter and the acts and the songs of a Dan Lino, they seem rather puerile today. But they weren't then. They were of the time, of the moment. And just as a great artist can produce something that seems puerile, but have you in stitches of laughter, remember Tommy Cooper, for example. I mean, very little Tommy Cooper said was actually funny, but you couldn't stop laughing. And that was the way it was with some of the great music hall stars. So, if Tommy Cooper was still alive, I would certainly include him in my, uh, in my act. About Nick Clay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a hand up just here. So, John, why did you finish so early? When I was a teenager, there was still plenty of music hall going on. I used to sneak off without my parents' permission to the Metropole in Edgware Road to see Max Miller. And there was Jimmy James, there was Jordan Morris, Norman Evans. All those people were performing in the 40s and 50s until television eventually killed them. Why, would, why did you stop if really before 1939? I stopped in the 1920s because I thought the bulk of Music Hall had died by then. There were people who went on, particularly Max Miller, of course, um, th that you mentioned, but not only Max Miller, there were a number of others who went on, the Crazy Gang, for example. A lot of them went on. But I think when they were then surrounded by cinema, television and radio, I don't think it was the same. And I think you had different sorts of audiences, the whole ambiance of music hall had changed. You had music hall performers, but you didn't have the whole music hall experience. And that's really why I drew a line with the death of two of the five greatest of them all, Mari Lloyd and Little Titch, in the 1920s. I think it would have been stretching it to go much further. Yes. I think the uh, repetition in music hall is actually part of its appeal and maybe something that's been lost in modern entertainment's craving for constant new material. I do. I do think that. I mean, we live in a disposable society these days. You have something, you use it, you dispose it, and you move on. Um, both economically and socially, people couldn't do that in earlier eras. It's only this last uh, two or three decades when we've really, well, maybe four decades, where we've actually been able to do that because the, the general quality of well-being is so much higher than it used to be, despite some people being left behind. So I do actually think we've lost something. We take things for granted and we toss them away. And those things might have been cherished for longer in uh, earlier eras. But 
I don't know how one changes that. I don't think one can. Um, yes? Changing the subject slightly, what gave you your passionate interest in cricket? Well, my sister, actually. Um, when I, my sister was 13 years older than me, so she had a pretty substantial share in my upbringing. My father was very sick. My mother was pretty sick, not in good health at all. And so my sister had more than a sister's normal care for a younger brother. And uh, she used to play with me, and she taught me to play cricket with a little wicket chalked on a garage uh, wall. And she used to go and watch cricket every weekend in Worcester Park, <coughs> which I think had less to do with the cricket than one or two of the players. Um, but even so, she instilled at that very early age a love of cricket in me, and it never went away. I had a little toy bat when I was about two, and the moment I actually saw cricket properly, I realized that was something that was totally absorbing. If you love cricket, it's in a sense like gardening. It's totally absorbing. Everything else is wiped out of your mind. Worries, concerns, whatever they may be, they've gone and you're totally absorbed in cricket. So I've always been very grateful to my sister for that, uh, for that early beginning. I think we've got time, we'd better have just one, one last question. Uh, this, this gentleman here, please. Thank you, Sir John, for such an insightful lecture. In terms of the venues themselves, how many music halls still stand and what do you see as the future for them? Or it? Well, there are very few. The gentleman who mentioned the Players' Theatre, I think that used to be Gatties under the arches at one stage. That was certainly a music hall there. But how much of the original building stands, I hope to find out on the 2nd of December <laughs> or on some other date. Um, Wilton's still stands, the City Varieties Leeds. I, I was at the City Varieties Leeds earlier, no, last Friday. And I have to say it was a very eerie experience for me because I stood on the stage where my father had topped the bill 99 years before. So it was a very, very moving occasion for me. So there are a few places, but there aren't all that many. Many of them succumbed to the wrecking ball and became cinemas in the 30s and 40s. And we knocked down things that today we would never dream of knocking down. We would regard them as part of our heritage and we would keep them. So there are far fewer than one would wish them to be. There are a handful around the country, but no more. I can't recommend this book enough. It's a, it's a really good read, and it's a, a wonderful history, and it's a, a, a very poignant personal history as well. So thank you very much, Sir John, for, for sharing with, with us tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.